Well, um, a professor in social anthropology. Um, he is very well known for his work of over 30 years working with indigenous groups in the Congo Brazzaville. He is the co-director of the Center for, or Center, the Extreme Citizen Science Research Group, um, and also co-director of the Center for the Anthropology of Sustainability at UCL. Um, so uh, I think I'll hand over the floor now to, to um, Jerome to uh, say much better than I can, all the amazing work he's been doing over these many decades. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Connie, and uh, very nice to meet you all and uh, talk to you today. Um, as I'm sure you're very aware, we're entering a period where 1.5 degrees Celsius has been passed. Uh, it's only going to get more unpredictable, and with that unpredictability comes great extremes of weather uh, and the way we think about how we manage environments is clearly being challenged and the sorts of uh, assumptions of reliability, stability and predictability that were uh, common to the way we would think about long term environmental management are starting to dissolve. And um, in other work I've been doing, I've been looking at the life process and, and how life deals with uh, the uncertainty and unpredictability of big events. And we have uh, many examples, of course, in the history of life of these cataclysmic events that you could never predict that have such a huge impact on uh, the possibilities of the future that you can't really prepare for them. But of course, life has found a way to do that, to prepare itself for those unpredictable calamitous events. And what it does is it generates diversity. And of course, sexual reproduction in multicellular organisms is one example of that way that life assures diversity, every individual being unique, so that whatever does happen, there's some chance that something, one of those unique uh, differences will have an impact to allow those, uh, that species or that particular variety of, of person to continue into the future. So, what I think that translates as in our current predicament is that we need to be thinking about not singular solutions to these uh, very serious environmental problems that are, uh, are emerging in our, in our time, but a multitude of solutions. And we need to be thinking about how we can create the, the best uh, or different tools and methodologies that enable us to build collaborations with local people who inhabit the places that uh, need to be protected and have indeed been looking after those places very often for very long periods of time. So how in the future can we ensure that the sort of diversity that already exists, and I'm sure, you know, you're probably very well aware that 80% you know, uh, of the remaining biodiversity is, is in the land, on the lands of indigenous people and local communities. And that really means that as we think about the future of conservation or the future of managing these very important biospheres uh, that we think of how we can collaborate with the communities that live there rather than come and impose colonial style protected areas where everyone's kicked out uh, and uh, experts like us come and dictate how those the future of those landscapes should unfold so um, what i've been really trying to do in the past 15 years or more is develop techniques that enable local people to express their particular, uh, in anthropology we have these words, ontology and epistemologies, the ways they organize the world, the ontology that they have that describes those landscapes that they inhabit, the epistemologies that they employ in order to know about those places. Uh, and they're very often not, uh, they don't map neatly onto the sort of scientific methodologies or approaches that we have. So part of the challenge in creating the uh, space for collaboration to occur is to try and support local ontologies and epistemologies to become present in those spaces and in ways where they can dialogue uh, in, in productive ways with other ontologies and as we're all academics of course uh, scientific and western ontologies being uh, key to that. So what I'm going to be talking about is some of the ways we're trying to create uh, what's sometimes called a third space, a, a, a different place where both ontologies and epistemologies can come together, can share their knowledge and see how they can productively dialogue to find solutions, to address problems uh, and to uh, um, uh, you know, better manage these places. Um, it's, it's been something which we've had uh, lots of failure 
uh, of course, and as one of my colleagues says, you fail your way to success. <laughs> and, uh, we've been trying hard to do that. Um, we have also had a, a few successes, which I'll, I'll describe too, but uh, it's important to recognize that uh, much of this work is uh, very difficult and often doesn't produce the results that you intend when you begin, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying. It just means that we need to try perhaps a bit harder. Okay, so um, smartphones are ubiquitous uh, among many communities now, and to our surprise as well, they, they also are now more increasingly present in very remote parts of the world. Uh, when we started doing our work, uh, there was very little connectivity to the internet. There is now quite widespread connectivity to the internet, and the possibilities offered by smartphones as instruments for monitoring, for documenting, for recording, uh, is quite phenomenal. Um, just to put it in, in, in perspective, uh, Albert Einstein, when he developed the general theory of relativity, had less accurate uh, tools for making measurements than we have in the smartphones that we have in our pockets. So this represents, I think, a very big opportunity for collecting very uh, accurate information about places, about processes, that uh, we, we should be exploiting more. And these small gadgets are remarkable for what they offer. So in order to do that, we, we, it's not enough to just focus on the, the, the technical object, the, the smartphone. You also need a methodology for how that smartphone is rendered uh, useful, accessible, and usable by local communities like the ones we work with in, in the Congo Basin. Um, I'm going to just introduce these communities a little bit because Part of the uh, theory of uh, or a hypothesis about how we would be effective is to work with some of the most marginal, uh, least westernized communities that, we, uh, that I've been working with anyway in the Congo Basin uh, in order to develop these technical solutions because we, we sort of feel that if we can develop solutions that work in these very difficult circumstances, they should be easy to apply in many other easier places. And we, we've worked across about 13 different countries, so we, we've tried it in many different places, and I'll describe some of our experiences uh, later on. But it really, uh, it began with these groups of uh, hunter-gatherers that I've been working with since uh, the early 1990s. Uh, this is the sort of place that uh, they call home. Uh, it's a, a moving home. They, they consider us uh, foreigners uh, and farmers as the nomads, they consider themselves to be the permanent occupants of these places. And they say, you know, if they look at farming villages, they say, look how the people are all going. And indeed, with education, youth are all fleeing to urban centers seeking employment. Uh, and it's and many villages are just left with older people and uh, in, in them. And so the hunter gatherers really uh, know very intimately this area of forest, uh, much better than anybody else indeed. And they circulate always in roughly the same areas and it's their intimate knowledge of the different resources and their availability at different times of year, which allow them to live well. Uh, uh, and they, they live very well. There's no word in their vocabulary for famine. And indeed, when I explained to them that there are places in the world where people starve to death, they, they just looked at me in disbelief and called me a liar. Um, it really wasn't something that they could conceive of. So it, this is a very successful solution for living in these forests. It's low impact, of course, because they, they move around a lot. But it also means that their forest usage is pretty invisible. And while I was in the forest, I uh, mapped the local territories of, you can just, yeah, the, the local territories of, of the, the local people. There was no area of the forest which wasn't occupied by uh, local communities. Every piece of firm land has a designated guardian. Um, every river, every uh, lake, uh, swamp is, is the responsibility of somebody or other. But of course, the government, after the civil war in the mid-1990s, was under pressure to generate income to rebuild the capital city that they had rather destroyed in that process. Um, and so what they did is they created these concessions. And the concessions are designed to create rent, uh, income for the government by renting it out to foreign multinationals, uh, in this case, mostly to, to cut wood, but there is, of course, the Nwabalindoki uh, National Park, which is the sort of compensation for the exploitation that occurs elsewhere in the forest. So uh, national government has been ignoring 
uh, the way that the villagers and the hunter-gatherers have been managing these areas for, for very long periods of time and imposed this new model on them. There was some uh, mention of some of the farmers' villages that are a bit bigger, and so sometimes the farmers are consulted for their uh, interest or that their, 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 they agree with the uh, work that the various concessionaires are, are, are trying to do, but uh, the hunter-gatherers were always ignored. And part of the reason for this is that the very def different regimes of value. So the African mahogany tree, which is one of the most important commercial species logged in this area, is valuable to outsiders when it's been cut down, when it's been turned into uh, sawn timber. Uh, but for local people, it's valuable because it provides very important medicines. It's, a, it's bark has a very powerful analgesic, which uh, if you you know, heat up and put your feet on if they're aching, or if you inhale uh, through steam uh, in, a, in, a, in a steam bath, it will reduce fever, it reduces pain. It's, it's a very uh, widely used and important medicine for, for the local communities. It also has other antibacterial properties too. Um, but its, its principal value for local people is that in a period of hunger, uh, when the rains have just started and the animals disperse very widely in the forest and hunting is difficult, it produces large amounts of these uh, very delicious caterpillars. And these caterpillars are considered a local delicacy. They're, they're rather like a sort of more meaty tiger prawn, uh, really very good. And one sack of caterpillars in the local village, uh, not even taken to an urban center, is worth about 500 euros. So they're very valuable uh, 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 commodity. Uh, they're collected by the poorest people in the community, by elderly people, women and children. Uh, and the, the processing is quite intense because they crawl away, of course, if you don't skewer them and burn off the hairs immediately. But the result is that uh, it represents a really important source of income for these normally very marginalized people who have very little access to money for the things that they might need, clothing, pots, pans, and so on. But when it's cut down, there's no more uh, production of these caterpillars. Standing, one of these emergent caterpillar trees, so the, the, not all sapoli will give caterpillars in the same way. It's the ones that protrude beyond the canopy that attract the butterflies, and they can produce literally thousands, millions of caterpillars. You, you squelch through them as you walk underneath these trees during the season. And, uh, and up to five sacks per uh, one of these good trees. So that represents two and a half thousand dollars to the poorest people in the community every year, or pretty much every year. Um, whereas when cut down, it represents some, I think, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per per tree uh, once it's exported. And obviously, the prices vary greatly depending on international markets. So these different regimes of value um, would suggest, of course, that sapoli is more valuable standing than it is cut down. But uh, because the decision makers aren't so interested in those standing values, uh, they encourage the cutting down. And very quickly, I've witnessed uh, areas of forest like this, uh, just within 10 years becoming areas of forest like this. Uh, and the power of Western uh, machinery uh, to transform landscapes really is quite remarkable. The logging company that dominated the area where I did my field work decided in 2003 they wanted to go for a forest stewardship council. And this was the first company in uh, Central Africa to try that. There was a company that had tried and failed uh, some five or six years earlier in Cameroon. But this uh, CIB, this company, was the first one to actually manage to hold on to their certificate once they'd been granted it. But their big problem was how to address uh, indigenous people and the local people who uh, they should make sure principle three of FSC says you must have no conflict of interest with local inhabitants and our other forest users and how to do that. So that's where they, they asked me to help. We had lots of meetings in uh, boardrooms where my hunter-gatherer friends would come and feel extremely intimidated by the, the, uh, the, the relationships that people had in those spaces. Uh, if you've never used toilets or, or, or opened doors because you don't have doors, uh, those simple things can become quite intimidating experiences when you don't know how to use those items. And, uh, and so we'd have these long discussions, which were very exhausting for everybody, and very little was ever uh, concluded from those discussions because uh, the situation was just too uncomfortable for, for each party. Um, so I suggested that rather than try and bring people in, I should go out to communities and talk to people on the ground. So I did. 
Now, these hunter-gatherers have an economy based on sharing, so there's, goods are free in, in, in their system. If you see something you need that somebody else has, you ask for it and they give it to you because uh, that's the, the courtesy. If they don't give it to you, it can become uh, uh, quite a problem. It's considered very impolite. So uh, I asked my Benjeli friends, I said, you know, well, what do you think about these loggers? They'd like to cut down sapoli trees and, and some other trees too. They said, well, look, this is a big forest. There's lots of sapoli trees. There's no problem if they want to cut down some of them. But we really don't want them to cut, touch our, uh, the, the, the trees we collect our, our caterpillars from. We don't want to, them to touch our medicinal trees. There are certain places where we have clean water springs coming out of the forest. We don't want the bulldozers to wreck those places. Um, and there are various fishing sites and other places that people really appreciate and those places they wanted protected. So what we did, or what I did, was just take a note of all these things and then we started and I encouraged the logging company that if they start to map these items then they can see whether there will be a conflict of interest in their cutting schedules on their various Asiet Daniel de Coupe, I can't remember the English uh, translation now, the, the annual cutting block. And, uh, and so we started off using the traditional method of waypoints and a GPS and there's so much human error enters into these processes where you have to transcribe from machines onto Excel sheets and so on. I know today it's not uh, so difficult, but, but in those days, this is 2003, 2004, it really was. So a company who'd been doing some traceability software suggested that they could help me if I wanted uh, by designing something that the hunter-gatherers could use. So we uh, developed some icons which represented fishing sites uh, there are certain sacred areas people didn't want touching, certain places for hunting and gathering foods and so on. And, and each one of those points would lead into a decision tree which would represent the different things people wanted to protect, protect it. So they themselves would go and use these uh, gadgets to map the, the items they wanted to be considered by the logging company. The only people who had difficulty using it were older people whose eyesight uh, had gone and they uh, couldn't really clearly see the icon. So then that created very nice little collaborations between the youth who loved to use the gadgets and the elders who actually knew where everything was. And so they would share knowledge as they walked through the forest. And uh, what was very nice was that the, you know, even in forests as heavily used uh, with important resources by the hunter gatherers as this, it was possible to make maps like this that the loggers used to then exclude trees from the cutting schedule. And trees that were excluded would then be painted at first white, but that doesn't last so well in the forest. They're now painted pink um, uh, to make sure that the, the, the chainsaws don't cut them. And so these very awkward situations in, in the offices were now uh, avoided and people would send their maps to do the talking on their behalf. And uh, I went to evaluate, I think, in 2014, and there had only been one case where a tree had been cut that people had been wanting to protect. So this has been working remarkably well uh, to protect local people's resources. Other things have come along to undermine it, mostly the pressure from uh, productivity, from uh, various new bosses who've taken over the logging company. And, uh, you know, and so whenever there's a corner that can be cut because the auditors don't pay attention to it, the workers cut the corners. And so instead of whole families being taken out, so women's uh, points of view can be taken into account, in the mapping uh, it's just a man chosen from the community now to make it quicker and simpler and so on so there are all sorts of ways these systems undermine over time and they they do unfortunately but there's very little uh, i can do it because it's fully in the hands of the the logging company um, at the moment so um after this work had finished in 2006 i was sort of wondering what to do with it further and i met a professor at ucl called muki hackley who specializes in citizen science and when I told him about this work, he said, oh, that's very interesting. Maybe we could do something further and consider this an, as part of the citizen science movement, which currently is very much biased to university educated, mostly male participants who often live in developed countries. And so this is a nice way to try and extend that to communities who are normally neglected and non-literate people in particular. And so we founded the Extreme Citizen Science Research Group uh, a situated bottom-up practice that takes into account local needs, practices and culture, works with broad networks of people to design and build new devices and knowledge creation processes to transform the ways in ways that minimize exclusion and discrimination. So that was the sort of objective and we, we, we still hold by that, it's still what we do. So that sort of has implications. So for instance, interfaces 
uh, you know, aren't suitable. Uh, we're all very familiar with these iconic symbols, uh, cross and uh, tick, and what they mean. But for non-literate people who've never been to school, it's pretty meaningless. So in the Central African Republic, for instance, the Bayaka community we worked with, they decided that when they understood what a tick meant, they would use this, the symbol they use in the forest when they want to show you this is the right path. And they add three leaves like that on the floor of the path. And that uh, then becomes the, 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 yes, you're in the right direction. Whereas if it's a, a, a place where there's a junction, in order to stop people from going on one path, they'll put a branch over the path so you know immediately which way to go. And so the cross becomes the branch across the path. And that way uh, you, you can make things relevant to people from their own experience. Um, we, we have various ways of developing the icons. This one is an example where the community decided to draw it themselves. And you can see, for instance, eco guard abuses was something important to them, but so was illegal logging and poachers camps. Uh, they wanted to monitor both those things. Uh, they also wanted to, for instance, monitor births and deaths because they're not considered citizens by the nation of Cameroon. So by being able to use the, uh, uh, they understood what the smartphone phone can do in terms of date and timestamp. They thought that would be very useful to help them start to monitor births and deaths. Um, uh, and then another one, for instance, here, alcohol production. Illegal alcohol is a real uh, uh, problem in this area, and there's lots of, uh, there's a massive increase in alcoholism. And, and so reporting on the places where the illegal alcohol was being produced was something uh, that they were very keen on doing too. So that's just really to show you some of the ways that we try and indigenize the interfaces so that they're available to all people. But there are other more technical problems, of course, as well. So, for instance, uh, when you're in villages or open spaces, the sunshine solar chargers work excellently. But sometimes when you're in very deep forest and you're in the middle of doing some rather large uh, walk, it's not so easy. So we tested, for instance, the Hatsudan Nabe, which is a very nice Japanese invention, a reverse electric blanket. So while you cook a, a portion of rice in that pot on the fire, it will, have, it will generate roughly enough electricity to charge a, a smartphone. And, uh, and if you're in the forest, that, that's quite a convenient way of charging. Uh, and other problems, of course, related to uh, the lack of connectivity. So we have uh, we developed an SMS system so that uh, important information could be prioritized and sent via text message. That doesn't work, of course, for photographs. Oh, it didn't work in the past for photographs and, and video and recordings, which are a very important part of how people document the, the, the points they take. And so those would have to be collected manually um, by our partners in the field. Uh, but as, as I said earlier, that is becoming less of a problem as connectivity is spreading uh, really quite remarkably. So we can have people collecting data deep in the Congo forest and we'll receive it at UCL uh, uh, almost instantaneously. It really is remarkable. Um, so we, we have a, a process, we've developed a methodology now through uh, trial and error of how to uh, work with communities most effectively. And the key is to work with uh, free prior informed consent in the first phase. So that means to really explain to the community what it is you plan to do with them uh, and, and what, uh, so sorry, maybe I should start slightly differently. So one thing we do is not to say what we plan to do at the beginning. So for instance, we might have, uh, I'll use the example of ZSL wanted us to do anti-poaching monitoring with local people. So we go into communities and we talk to so what, what are the problems that you, you, you have? Uh, and if they mentioned poaching as being a problem, then we would suggest that we could help them to address that problem. And that was the way that we would try and make sure that the engagement was uh, uh, as genuine as possible. Uh, and then once we'd uh, agreed that yes, we or the community agreed they'd like to work with us, then you need to explore what the positives and the negative potentials of that collaboration are and start to explain the, uh, the, you know, how that, how that can be avoided if it's negative and how it could be enhanced if it's positive. So uh, local problem identification, then we get the agreement, free prime form consent process, which is ongoing because in Central Africa, it's not just a one-off thing. It's a, an ongoing relationship you need to maintain and people can withdraw at any time. Um, and so we would then start to design the decision tree, the, the actual, uh, process by which they would uh, document uh, the uh, I, the items they wish to collect. 
And here you can see the decision tree being worked out on the floor uh, with big uh, cards so that people can, can do it. Here we've got local community members uh, drawing the icons that they want. The way we test icons is we hold them up without saying what they are and ask the people to tell us. And if everyone manages to tell us correctly, we know we've got the right icon. If not, then we go back to the drawing board and try and make another icon. And people would, sorry, did I? Yeah, so then the testing. Once, once we've developed the decision tree, we get different parts of the community to test it. So young people, elders, women, men, and so on, going off, looking at it from their point of view. They notice things missing. They notice things that they want to add. They tell us, and then we, 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 we can add them in. This is an example of some uh, anti-poaching software that uh, was developed by a local community in Congo. And this is the front screen, the, the one in blue. And so one of the things is that poachers would often leave stashes of weapons in the forest. Uh, you'd find dead animals and blood trails and so on, poachers camps, uh, stacks of trophies of various sorts. Um, for instance, if you follow that line, you get to ivory, uh, there are often houses which would keep lots of ivory and then various uh, sacks of meat and so on. Um, but then eco guards, one of the issues around eco guards was that they would beat people up. And their local communities were very keen to record this so that they could document the abuses they were going through. And so these represent different uh, uh, misbehaviors by eco guards that community members wanted to report on. But at the same time, they also wanted to report on the poaching that's going on because it is a serious problem and it is their animals that are being poached and, and so people did want to report that too. So um, one of the very interesting things is that wherever we have done anti-poaching work, communities also want to record living animals uh, and, uh, and, and that has actually proved to be extremely useful in, in some of the projects we've done. This is from uh, work in, in the Jar Reserve or around the Jar Reserve in, in Cameroon with ZSL. And we started off with, a, I think, a four or five year Darwin project funding. But after it finished, it was so important to ZSL that they've been funding it through their own uh, sort of project funding to, to continue. And the reason it was uh, useful and, and, and productive was that not only did it lead to seizures, some important seizures of ivory and other uh, illegal wildlife trade items, but it also led to some arrests of some very important actors within the uh, the networks that do this uh, illegal wildlife trade. Um, and uh, the unexpected uh, positive thing was that they could then see where the animal corridors were around the reserve, where the elephants were walking to get uh, further afield and, and other animals. And this was really important for developing later uh, strategies for the patrols of eco guards so that they would make sure that those areas didn't have poachers installed in them and so on. So there were all sorts of other benefits which came from this kind of uh, uh, collaboration. We worked uh, in East Africa with some Maasai communities and there they're very worried about the impact that building conservancy is having on their wild plant medicinal plants. And so uh, in an extraordinary two hours, they listed 126 different medicinal plants that they wanted to document in the local area. And we went round and we, we, we started to document these plants. But what we found is that they didn't, in, they didn't like the decision tree. So what they actually wanted was just a swipe through so they could just go uh, a bit like you do on some social media platforms. So we developed uh, other ways of doing this. So we developed a, a deck of cards with the items on with little RFUI tags. And you can see this uh, person, he's going through the, the different uh, cards. He's found the right one. And he then takes the telephone, holds the card up against the item. And I don't know if you catch it. But anyway, the machine tells him, yes, we've got the GPS location. We've got the timestamp, the date stamp. Um, so we've been experimenting with different ways of, of collecting the data too. Um, but uh, fundamentally, uh, to do this requires a lot of consultation and participation from the community, telling people of risks and advantages, how to build free prime form consent agreements. But then what we found is that that's not enough. You need a community protocol, a set of rules for the following through of the project. And this is where the community tell you, for instance, well, those mappers, they do need some remuneration. And this is how much it should be. And that needs to be discussed in public with everybody so that there isn't this sort of suspicion and, 
and feeling that some people are being benefited more than others. And, and, and that uh, helps to prevent lots of problems down the line uh, in, in, in the relationships and running of the projects. Who's responsible for keeping the phones in good order, keeping them charged, making sure that they're... Those sorts of things you just need to work out with people uh, so that the project can start running itself. Um, Co-designing the decision trees and icons, as, we've, uh, as I've just mentioned, and then people going out and starting to collect data. You need to correct and validate those data. So there's a process of reviewing it together with the, the mappers and other people. Um, but then actually what takes more time from us, the organizers, is organizing for action, how to address the problems people are, uh, are identifying. And that requires building a network of community representatives. And we found it's much more useful and helpful if uh, communities connect with one another to discuss the issues that they're identifying and start to develop their own shared messages for advocacy. And it's that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, discussion which is much more effective than you, the expert, coming in and saying, this is what you need to do and this is how you'll do it. Um, so uh, we also uh, then had to make sure that translated into some sort of action. So arranging, we did a lot of work on illegal logging, which was very big in Cameroon. And we would take uh, local community representatives could come and present the maps of the illegal logging to uh, the local forestry guy. But he was actually involved in the illegal logging. He was the one giving out the, the, uh, you know, the, the permissions. And so it became one of these awfully difficult, awkward situations. So what we ended up realizing we had to do is always invite the superior of the person who we were presenting the data to, to be present in the meeting. So if it was the local, you'd have the regional boss. If it was the regional level, you'd have the national boss. If it was at the national level, whoever were the main uh, funders of that particular ministry or contributing to those particular uh, processes, they should be invited too. So, and that oversight tended to undermine the potential for those very awkward situations to develop. Um, and then, of course, monitoring and reporting on the efficacy of those actions is something which requires a lot of effort and time. So th that is the basic structure of how we do Excite, but we've been developing a, a bunch of other approaches now, which I'm just going to briefly introduce you to. Um, so, for instance, we've been working, a lot of farmers are finding it very difficult, particularly rural uh, subsistence farmers, to uh, work out when they do when they need to do uh, certain things in northern Ghana if you haven't had the rain digging yam mounds is just impossible uh, in the clay soil that they have so uh, lots of activities require very fine uh, coordination with the weather and when the weather becomes erratic and unpredictable it creates lots of problems for farmers the other thing with when you get these heat spikes and or dampness spikes it uh, leads to particular illnesses uh, spreading among plants, uh, pests as well, of course. And so this is a project we did in Nigeria, uh, in Western Nigeria, and the farmers contributed uh, by first um, mapping their uh, farm, uh, and they could do it either just taking a GPS point on the farm or actually mapping it out on a satellite image. And then they would add the information about which crops they were growing into that uh, data so that, uh, that they would be aware of it, but also uh, one part of the network was an NGO that supported local farmers, also the regional government uh, agricultural extension workers. And, uh, and so people could then describe whatever they wanted about their farm, but they could also uh, describe problems and issues that they were facing and ask uh, a, the community of other farmers involved in this uh, what they were doing to address uh, the fact that their yams have uh, started to dry up and, and shrivel uh, or whatever it is. And so the, the way that uh, uh, these questions were then shared was in text form, but also uh, in voice messages. And so using uh, WhatsApp, uh, they could, we could create communities of farmers who could then advise one another on how they had addressed the particular issues that were being noticed on the farm. And there were also uh, the, 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 the chains of discussion were recorded uh, so that they could be re revisited later. And so we, we had this uh, sort of quite wide network, but a collaborative network in this case, where uh, individual farmers could support one another with solutions they'd found, uh, with warnings about the arrival of particular pests so that people could take preemptive actions as well, which would often be very important in preserving uh, their livelihoods. 
And we could connect that data to government extension workers so they could keep track of what was happening in that, that local area. So th th those are other forms of collaboration we've been working on. But really what I wanted to emphasize is that you know, the, the, the way that we work is really very heavily based on collaborations. This is at the sort of academic technical side, uh, working with a whole range of, of different uh, people and organizations. Uh, we're doing work on, say, veterinary, uh, on the emergence of zoonotis illnesses in, uh, in some places uh, in, in CAR and, and Cameroon. Um, but uh, lots and lots of collaborations, and each time it's possible because there is so much flexibility within the, the software. And I just wanted to briefly uh, mention some of the uh, uh, projects that we have done. Um, uh, this one with the Ashen Inca, they have lots of drug dealers. They live on the Peruvian border, and the drug cartels come in and build these little drone uh, landing strips so that they can land the drones with the drugs on, they can recharge them and or refuel them and then send them off on the next stage. And, uh, and this is really annoying, plus poachers and others use those same uh, access points to uh, uh, take things from their territory. So they wanted to map it and they thought that if they can map it, they can provide those maps to the local police and then the police will come and take action. But actually they would provide the maps and the police would do nothing and uh, the solution just uh, the problem continued so they said well that's not going to work for us so they've developed another solution which is more risky but uh, more effective which is where they send the youth to to arrive first with their bows and arrows and they say look you're on our territory they film them they show them a map of their territory they say here you are uh, this is our territory you're not allowed to be here uh, today we've come peacefully to warn you tomorrow we're going to come with our poison arrows and if you're still here there's going to be a problem and, uh, and it's worked very effectively to uh, uh, remove all the people who've tried to, but it's a risky strategy, of course. Uh, and so that's an example of failure. Um, in the Panatal, uh, some work done uh, there with the fishers uh, was really sh sh demonstrating that they, they needed much larger areas to, to, to fish effectively, and the government was denying them access to those places. So once the uh, this had all been mapped and shown that they understood the, the, the way that those systems worked, those uh, water, waterways worked. They were granted a 5,000 kilometer uh, reserve for, for their fishing and it has become very important for their livelihoods. Um, we worked in, with the Nyai, in the Nyai Nyai Conservancy with the Khoisan who live there and they have a big problem because cattle herders bring cattle to water at the water holes that are intended for the wild animals. And this destroys the water holes. It makes them all muddy and, and unpleasant, as well as frightening away the animals, of course, the wild animals. So what they wanted to do, because this has an impact on their livelihoods, that their quota for hunting is based on how many animals are using the conservancy. And so if there aren't many animals, then their quota for hunting is, is greatly reduced. So they uh, wanted to take photographs of the ears of the cattle so they could identify who the owners were. And similarly to the Ashen Inca in Brazil, tell the local police so that they could take action against the, herd, the, the owners of the herds. But of course, the local police were mates with the owners of the herds, and so they didn't take action, and, and that didn't work. Um, so then the uh, San wanted to get more involved in the annual game count, which is on the basis of which is their, their, what their offtake can be as, as hunters. And so we worked with them looking at how they could understand and read maps. And we've done quite a lot of work on geographical literacy among non-literate people, how it, how it works and how it uh, operates most effectively. And that's been much more successful. Um, in uh, the Prey Lang Forest in Cambodia, the University of Copenhagen adapted the software for use there. And they had a remarkably successful uh, project with local communities uh, catching illegal, hunter, uh, illegal loggers and chasing them out of the forest, making reports on this, and, uh, and, and actually being very effective. They've even created a, a, a protected area within the Prey Lang Forest now as a result of local community action. Um, so a, a great range of projects. One project in Zambia, for instance, was uh, to document flooding in urban areas because with the extreme rainfall that's coming, flooding becomes very much more uh, serious. And so people wanted to start monitoring where it's happening so that they could uh, take actions to, to try and mitigate against that. So a, a very wide range of different projects in India with the Nayaka. Uh, the Nyaka are hunter-gatherers and they always avoid the landslides. Uh, since tea plantations have been planted all over the hillsides, when it rains very heavily now, they get very big landslides and many newcomers have installed their 
uh, communities along valleys, and so they're very vulnerable to being covered by the mud. And the Nyaka never get caught by the mud. They're always able to preempt uh, and predict when these uh, mudslides are happening. So they're now monitoring the forest in a way that they do uh, uh, and, and the way that they, they use uh, uh, different signs coming from the forest to know that mudslides will, will be coming soon. And, uh, and so they can share that knowledge with the uh, local communities and protect them from being uh, uh, covered. So those are just some of the, the projects that we've been working on. But the, the, the sort of real sort of core of all these uh, practices, as I've been mentioning, uh, that communities define or co-define the agenda. That's always very important for their participation. FPIC community protocols, that they are supported to do this work uh, and their capacities uh, developed. So it's a long-term engagement with a the community. Um, then creating access to these different uh, places where they could, in theory, find solutions to their problems. Uh, and uh, the challenges, of course, are that this all takes a lot of time and effort. It's not a quick solution if, if that's what you need. Um, people will need technical support over time and, uh, and working out long-term sustainable solutions for doing that are not self-evident. Uh, and, and though we've had some success, the loggers have been using it now for over almost 20 years, um, but, uh, but, but that's a, a, an exception really. We've now uh, got a build with just uh, a new uh, uh, entire sort of re rebuilding of the software, which is one of the things I'd, if any of you are planning on building apps, it's a nightmare because <laughs> every time they change uh, the operating system on mobile phones, you have to then update your app to stop it from uh, glitching. Uh, anyway, so this is the latest one we've done. Uh, new entry system, just using the uh, patterning that uh, many of you will be familiar to help protect people if they're collecting uh, potentially sensitive information. The, uh, we now have a whole screen so that you can just do on the phone, you can program the phone and develop the software just based in the phone itself. You don't need a laptop computer next to it and you can uh, check and validate and test it uh, as well to see if it works well. And then of course people collect, uh, they can record messages, extra information about things that they've seen. They can take photographs of what they have seen uh, as a way of documenting things. Uh, and that can be shared in various ways. Um, we've also now developed a much more, it looks a bit complicated and you can't see very much, but it's, it's easier now to edit mistakes uh, that people may have made as they've been collecting information. Um, and we can also have background location tracking so you can actually see if someone has been to those places uh, or the places that they had planned to go rather than uh, somewhere else. Um, so these are the, the, that's the latest iteration we're just testing at the moment. Um, but one of the interesting comments we got from some of our uh, uh, users was that uh, our maps lie. Um, that maps where, for instance, you've mapped a river, uh, in the dry season, that river might not be there. Uh, and in the wet season, it's suddenly huge and large. Uh, and so your maps aren't oh, our maps, which are just fixed. Uh, are lying effectively they're not not uh, uh, showing the real change we did some work on and this is very uh, pertinent for things like famine relief where you might think that this area is actually uh, doing okay it's, well it's not doing okay but it's not in a crisis but actually it's very quickly becoming a crisis and so how can you create a uh, quick reactive maps that will show changes in, in situations that can have very big implications for those people living there uh, in terms of preparing uh, a response or, or food or, or whatever is needed in that, that particular context. Another thing which is related to the uh, problems of knowing about the quality of the things you're mapping. So uh, this is work in, in the Omo uh, River Valley and there it's very important that the big pastoralist communities, people are always taking their cows, they need to find good grazing, they need to find good water. But if you've got 100 head of cow and you walk them to a cattle and you walk them to a, a, a grazing area and the grazing is, is, is rubbish, it's just trampled down, you've got a big problem on your hands. Or if the water source is no longer functioning, your cows are thirsty and you've got to get them back home or get them to another water source. And this is often the source of great suffering uh, for the cows and for the people that depend upon them. So we developed this system where 
uh, we increase confidence levels by the numbers of people that uh, report on those places. Um, and, uh, and, and so you can see that, you know, this is definitely not good. Uh, that may be better and, and so on. And you can report different land use. So even though this is a grazing area, this is actually a water pond where you could go and take your cattle to, to, to catch water, to get water as well. So you can start to map much more complexity through this. And uh, in contrast to uh, uh, satellite mapping where you, you don't have that kind of information, we've been able to map, for instance, this is the, the Omo River here. Um, this was mapped by about five or six people in, in a number of weeks. It's very quick, it's very efficient, and the detail is really quite uh, uh, astonishing. So in, in that map, I mean, we've, we've had to disguise the key because it's, we, we don't have permission from the users to, to share that. Um, but basically, you can find out where the water sources are uh, present, uh, if they're available, uh, if it's a hand pump, is the hand pump actually working, which makes a big difference for, for people. Um, what, what the quality of the grass is and, and the grazing and so on, and, and indeed many other things. Um, this is an example from the forest where you can't see from above under the canopy, but there are elephants uh, constantly moving through this forest, and knowing that uh, is only possible through this ground data that people are collecting. Uh, and so you can plan your, your animal corridors. And it's really key to uh, also ensure that uh, if people want to, they can start sharing this on social media. And, uh, and there, a lot of our work now is to work on how we can connect up with different social media platforms, depending on what's used mostly in, in those particular countries. And we're also trying to work out ways to connect with uh, direct payments so that if, for instance, you're doing a forest restoration project, if a community's planted lots of trees, they can go by, photograph those trees regularly. You can see them growing and then organize some sort of direct payment to communities. That's what we're just about to begin in Cameroon and CAR now. So lots and lots of collaborations at lots of different levels and, uh, and quite a lot of uh, grant applications <laughs> in the process. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Okay, Sarah. Sorry, so, yeah, we have some time for questions. I mean, 15 minutes. Uh... I'll ask a question. Sure. So, I, I, you probably dealt with this earlier. I, apologies for the long of this. No, no. Um, Sorry. Let's begin to that just so the oh. online audience can hear you. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Is that all? Yeah, I think it's on. Okay. Um, apologies for lateness. Um, but um, I just was um, lo looking at what you were proposing uh, from the push that I saw onwards, um, the mapping systems and so on. Uh, how do you start to actually designate somebody to act as an arbitrator or a facilitator? Because inevitably, when you start 